Take four. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back to the Rose Wall Reviews. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us, and thank you, Lynn, for being being here to lead us through the process. Well, today you're going to do a little bit more of that leading because we're going to go behind the scenes today. But before we start, I want to read something I found today, and that is, there is a silver lining in this pandemic, perhaps, in that we all have realized how much we love the big screen and love the big sound. This is true. For us, it's the red carpet where we would normally work, but uh, we've been learning. Uh, this is our third, I think, our third go at the Rose Wall, and our, the third time to be involved in the visual interviews online, the virtual interviews online. Mm -hmm. And today we've, we've done quite a few. Tonight there were a total of 12 people. Yeah. 10 that were live and two pre-recorded. Yeah. And I do think this is the third dimension of storytelling that we're about to launch into here. But there's one more thing I wanted to share with you. And this is from Roger Durling, the executive director of the Santa Barbara International Film Festival. Something I just learned today. He's written a book. And the book is Cinema in Flux, A Year of Connecting Through Film by Roger Darling. There's the back of the book. It'll be available in hardcover, uh, released September 2021. 20, and it's got wonderful photos of all the different times we've, 36 years really, mm -hmm. of the film festival that he's been at the helm for about 17 years, I think, some, somewhere in there. Long time. And one of the things he said about film I thought was really interesting is that on March 16th, 2020, we were told we were going into lockdown. That first day, reeling and disbelieving, I quickly understood the role cinema had to play and the role I had to play, movie recommendation. Cinema has always inspired, transported and educated, and I cannot diminish its essential role in helping to lighten our burden, to comfort, and to distract. I knew people would be turning to film, and here's what I liked about it. Quote, I thought of cinema as the second responder. Mm -hmm. End quote. Mm. Isn't that cool? That's I thought beautiful. That was, that was great. Certainly true for me this year. Was it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nothing but time to watch movies for a lot of us. A lot. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't realize you were watching movies. Um, and, oh, well, no, I really didn't. Because I know you've been busy working on documentaries. So what's been interesting to me is as we've been working on this, we must have seen very different movies. Oh, yes, yes. Well, Lynn is very good at preparing for the festival and seeing the things coming up and, and, and in addition to whatever else you like to watch. And I myself... Um, have been in something of a student mentality, just catching up, catching up, catching up with, uh, you know, the decades we have now, about a century now of films to watch. And uh, so I haven't necessarily been seeing a lot of contemporary stuff. But oh, how about that? Yeah. A student. I think that's very cute. Hmm. And a documentarian. So he's also been mar uh, busy making his own movies. So <clears throat> yeah, there's that. So tonight we interviewed all all of what I was calling earlier the third dimension, the storytellers behind the story telling. And um, I think I'm going to do this in a different order in, in the way they did it. Uh, Jess Tange, and I'm not 100% sure if that's the right pronunciation, but I think so, is with Variety. I'm sure you're aware of that magazine. And this is the Artisans Award, the Vanguard Artisans Award, uh, no, the Variety Artisans Award. Uh, given to the people behind the scenes. She was great. She had done her homework. Mm -hmm. Now what I realized is um, more than I could have imagined goes on behind the scenes. Although you see it as the credits roll and roll and roll and roll and then they roll in a different country and roll in a different country and then there's even more and people are walking out of the theater often mm -hmm. when they're still rolling. Yep. It's, it's incredible sometimes. I think you said thousands of people could be on a movie at some point. At some, with some productions, definitely, yeah. If not hundreds. Well, one of the things we found out tonight is how much they actually had to work online, virtually, with each other mm -hmm. uh, to collaborate on a film. And, th and it was a real challenge 
for a lot of them. So one of the th ones I wanted to start with really was um, Donald Graham Burt and Jan Pascal were production designers and set decorators. They are up for an award for Mank, which is uh, the movie about um, Randall Hurst's life as well as uh, uh, Gary Oldman who plays Mank, who's writing Citizens Kane at the same time Citizen Kane. Yeah. Citizen Kane, yeah. thank you, at the same time. And it's all filmed in black and white. It takes place in 1937. So one of the questions that was um, asked about the production design and set decoration is how, how did they distill the essence of this film uh, today? Here we are in 2021. How, how do you take what you have today and do all the research you, you need to do to distill that essence of a time in 1937 and do the whole thing in black and white. And the big surprise for me was it was on stage. Wasn't that a surprise? But yeah, it was and it wasn't though, because so, they do so much with, with stages and sets like that where, where you think they're really, you know, in the mountains somewhere, or in this case, in a castle somewhere, and they're really just uh, on a stage in Hollywood. You know, I thought they probably could have used uh, the Hearst Castle that's here in California. It's worth touring, by the way, mm -hmm. come visit us. Um, because it's just there, it's available, and, and a lot of those scenes were, were about mm -hmm. being in his home. Mm -hmm. And so, but no, they had to collect chandeliers and glasses and dinnerware and silverware and uh, build chairs, build tables, build everything for yeah. this set. Yeah. Uh, I, I was blown away by that. And why I started with production design and set decoration, and, and then I think next to cinematography, is because um, what I got from this conversation from this group of 12 people is that they all build on each other. Mm -hmm. And they must collaborate, and they must know what's in the director's head. Now, as an editor, and, and you're the person that puts it all together in the end. You have to take a slice of every single one of these pieces of the pie and, and bring it together, right? Mm -hmm. So when you edit a piece where you have an enormous set or you're on a farm in Missouri or someplace like that, or you are on a stage and then you have all these little trinkets, you have these chairs and these cups and these tables and these chandeliers and you have lighting and you have sound, and you have makeup, and you have hair, and you have all this stuff going on. How do you weave all that together? I mean, that is the million dollar question, isn't it? Uh, how do you, how do you make, I think you used the word at the top of this question, though, a conversation. I think it is a conversation artistically and literally between all of these people and the departments they represent, and, you know, um, at some point you're just sort of, uh, working very hard to be precise, but at a certain point you're just crossing your fingers. I imagine that it, you know, other people will show up. And imagine having to do all this virtually this last year. Amazing. I can scarcely oh, imagine. It's yeah. unbelievable. Uh, cinematography was Joshua James Richards. He did songs My Brothers Taught Me, an mm. interesting movie. And he was the cinematographer for the wonderful Nomad Land. Mm -hmm. And I was telling you about that movie. Um, because he really had to travel across America with the, the people that do live that lifestyle. They're nomads and they have gotten in their trails and their RVs and they pitch their tents uh, temporarily in different places around the country. It's, it's really a phenomenal movie. And um, he said that he had to capture the American landscape and uh, evoke a, a tenderness and a fragility in this movie because of the, the, the people in it were real non-actors. They were really living that life. And he uh, researched, oh, and a lot of what these people had to say was st steeped in research. They would start out by saying, all 12 of them, research, research, mm -hmm. research. And this guy researched um, classical romantic American painters mm -hmm. to capture lighting, color, that sort of thing. Yeah, he brought that up when he mentioned Manifest Destiny as, as the the sun on the horizon and something more decayed in the foreground uh, kind of representing that and that's right yeah it was very interesting 
it's uh, worth watching again. Everybody should go see it. Oh, absolutely. So that's Nomadland and and cinematography. I he one word he used in terms of what he thinks he is as a cinematographer is a curator. Mm. And, and so you have production design and you have a set and you have a script, but then you have a curator. Someone's yeah. going to figure out what the shots are and, and where and at what time of day and absolutely that sort of thing. So this is why I started because I I feel like I'm building from the ground up, mm. and the icing of course is the editor. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, now we well I'll take a little tiny segue from the ground up because the score is far more of a character in a movie than I realized. And sure. I realized that this year in the movie Mank, because it's, a, it's an original score, it's up for an award, uh, in order to, to have the voices and the general sound in, in, in any event, the rooms inside, outside, wherever they were, and the music in the background had to sound like it was from that era. Mm -hmm. And it's such an original score, and it's, it's, so, it's a strange score, actually, but it worked for that movie, which is why it's obviously up for an award. Mm -hmm. These same two guys, and this was uh, Trent uh, Reznor and Articus Ross. The Atticus. Way, Atticus, thank you. Who've worked together for a very long time. Also, also did Soul, this, this charming, charming Pixar movie. And, and so they were doing Soul, actually uh, two years ago, and then they got Mank, and they had just finished doing another score, so they've been working together for quite a long time. And listening to them, for me, it was, it was really interesting to think about how the, how the movie would uh, be without the score. Yeah, it is another character, usually, you know, I mean, you can really change so much about how a scene plays with, with what's playing over it. Are, are, is there music in documentaries very often? Yeah, I mean, it, it tends to vary as much as, um, as you'll see in, in films where uh, sometimes a narrative film, like what we were discussing here, uh, will have minimal or no score in some cases, and other times um, people will sometimes criticize them for having too much, and I think the same applies to documentary. Um, How interesting, because for some reason I don't think of documentaries as... As, as the score being as much of a character in a documentary. Because usually those documentaries are s true stories and real mm -hmm. people and real places. So I think it takes more of a background, like sort of a, an extra type of a character. It can, yeah. And you know, uh, one thing I heard from a, a, someone who worked on a, a film I'd love in my childhood was that if, if a lot of these people were talking about the artisans in the background, if they're doing their job really well, they'll become invisible. And I think with the score as well, you know, it's, it's the attention to detail that allows you to not notice the details as a viewer. That, um, wow, that really, that's, that's genius. Yeah. That's, that's a great way to... Well, it rings true, doesn't think, it? Yeah, very much yeah. so. You're not thinking about the production, unless you're already coming at it with a fascination for that. You're just sort of, it's facilitating the larger story that you're getting lost in. It's really true. Mm -hmm. And I n used to notice that in the old westerns, where there were full orchestras in the background, when they were running across the plains on their horses, and there mm -hmm. were violins and tubas and trumpets and stuff in the old mm -hmm. westerns. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's talk about overkill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be too aware. Very funny. Yeah. <laughs> very, very funny. Um, now, again, with music, Leslie Odom Jr., oh my gosh, what a talent, that mm -hmm. guy. He, he was in Hamilton, in Broadway. Mm -hmm. uh, he also stars in One Night in Miami and wrote with Sam uh, Ashworth. The original song for which they're uh, up for an Oscar called Speak Now. And they did this together in two weeks online FaceTime only. One guy, Sam was in Nashville, mm -hmm. and Leslie Odom Jr. was in, uh, where was he? He was in LA? No, Miami. Miami. So again, I, I, I go back to this, this whole last year in cinema, 
And to Roger's point as well about being a second responder, everybody figured out how to get this done. Everybody did their absolute best to bring us the entertainment and to respond to our needs being mm -hmm. quarantined at home and brought us really, really amazing entertainment and including wonderful music like this song, uh, Speak Now. I, I thought that was a very interesting um, uh, interview with those two guys. And at the end, she asked everybody the question, it was uh, along the lines of um, how would you advise people who are young or striving to get into these businesses uh, what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, were, were you here when yeah. when he answered that, especially Leslie Odom Jr.? Uh, yeah, well, I think they, uh, uh, he, he basically said that Mia Neal's answer was, um, was one that he wanted to echo about, uh, about going into theater and learning to do things on a theater budget and then feeling uh, like you have a lot of abundance when you go into film and television where there's usually more money for, um, you know, production design, hair and makeup, et cetera, et cetera. Perfect segue, because that's where I was going next. Um, Mia Neal did the hair and makeup for Ma Rainey, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, an, mm -hmm. another remarkable film. I just, we had a lot of incredible stories. We were talking yesterday about how heavy some of these topics were. Mm -hmm. Um, but then we also had all, all these wonderful ones that we're talking about today, Mel Rainey's Black Bottom being one of them, and of course, Chadwick Boseman, the, the star in that movie, in my mind, and Viola Davis, last night won SAG Awards for, for their performances, and we agree that probably Chadwick Boseman should win the Oscar, and has already won the Golden Globe for that. Uh, he learned to play the trumpet for this movie. That's dedication. Wow. And and he was ill at the time and no one knew it. Mm -hmm. It's just remarkable to me. But uh, as far as research went, um, Mia Neal had to, <laughs> she had seven photos total, total from the 1920s of Ma Rainey to work with. Mm -hmm. Total. And the only thing she she got from those photos was how much she broke the rules wearing fur coats in the summer wearing mm -hmm. horse hair wigs and that sort of thing mm -hmm. actually got a horse hair wig mm -hmm. actually made a hundred plus wigs for that movie by the way but mm -hmm. she got real horse hair and wove a wig at one did did that it was one strand of horse hair uh, or was it a horse tail you know, I don't remember the finer details. I just remember that she worked very hard on what I think may have been an antique piece, but barring that was something, something with an authentic connection to the story that she. she yes, had because done. Ma Rainey wore horse mm -hmm. hair wigs. Mm -hmm. That's right, and it took her. You're right, very hard, eighty hours to make just that one wig. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the wigs she made, she built, took on average of about forty hours, and there were a hundred of them. Dedication is the word mm -hmm. there, but to work on from just seven photos. You know, what strikes me about every single one of these people, they do their part, they do, everybody does their little part and they do it so well, then it's all handed over to the editor who may not know there's a horse hair wig in the, in the movie, but knows how to pull all the threads together. That, Still, I don't know, I keep saying the same thing because I'm so amazed by that. So let's, so you have the director on top of this pyramid, then you have the, the actors, and then you have all these other people that we're, we're talking about. I wonder how much they get to communicate with each other on all their parts before it all goes to the editor. It's a good question. How, how closely do you think the editor works with the director toward the end? I imagine quite closely. Um, if, yeah, it can depend on the story and the people working on it, but um, usually the, you know, there's this, this thing we, we pay extra for sometimes, the director's cut, and that um, oh. you know, might be the difference between uh, an extra 20 minutes or whatever amount of time that, uh, that the director had as their original vision and uh, what, what the studio thought they'd make their money back with. 
All right, so um, Mulan, talking about um, visual effects. Uh, Sean Fadden, we talked to him about Mulan, the wonderful Disney film, which is really, really terrific, by the way. And uh, he, ha he went on a, uh, in helicopters on a scouting for a space in New Zealand. Mm. And once he found that space, he realized he could create the mountain and the avalanche he needed for the epic battle in that movie. Mm. And the steam around it so that it would remain sort of PG and it wouldn't be a horrific bloody battle. Mm -hmm. He hid a lot of implied violence in the steam. Mm -hmm. And this was uh, the VFX? Uh, yes. The head of VFX, I don't know what his Exactly right, the head of VFX. Mm -hmm. He had 80 soldiers on one side of the battle and about 67 soldiers on horses they built mm -hmm. on the other side of the battle. But he had to make it look like there were 500 on each side of the battle yeah. for that epic part in that movie Mulan. So we learned a lot about visual effects and how that worked. Mm -hmm. And wasn't that interesting how when we saw the movie, you mm -hmm. know, they play us clips in between the interviews and we saw how they do the layers and layers and layers of visual effects. I'd never seen that before, had you? Uh, I think throughout the years I'd, I'd seen something like that, but it is always amazing to watch how they'll take one image and really set uh, stage by stage, transform it into something completely different by the end. Yeah, um, um, Alexandra Byrne is the person uh, that was uh, up for an award for costume design. And she's eons of experience and uh, used color, a color palette that would take Emma through an entire year so that every season, winter, spring, summer, fall, she changed the palette just a little bit so that color was showing you what season they were and mm -hmm. when they were in that season by subtle changes of color which I thought was interesting because I didn't, before now, recognize that color tells a story. Mm. Fascinating. So I can't wait to watch that because I'm going to have a look for that red cape that also went through all four seasons but in various tones of red. Of the film Emma, yes? Yes. 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 Yeah, Absolutely. I look forward to seeing that. Uh, Nicholas uh, Becker uh, was up for an, is up for an, uh, an award for sound design and mixing for the uh, movie Sound of Metal. So to be up for a movie about sound as the sound designer mm. makes sense. Yeah. I think it's amazing. Uh, he had a whole year of preparation before he had to do this movie and found that uh, there was a fine arc between the point of hearing and the point of viewing. And I was trying to make the point about how if I was a deaf person, I'd be viewing, not hearing, maybe reading subtitles, reading mm -hmm. lips, but as a seeing person, I have the benefit of seeing and hearing. Mm -hmm. But as a more visual person on a, with a visual sort of media, mm -hmm. I, I tend to see, see more than I hear, mm -hmm. except for here in The Sound of Metal, you're forced, you're really, you're really learning a lot about how to hear sound mm -hmm. from a dead, deaf person's perspective. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, my mother's deaf. And so that's a part of my life I've had to learn to, to live with and to have more compassion for mm -hmm. and to learn how to listen and to communicate with her better than I did growing up. Mm -hmm. And I took some of that for granted until mm -hmm. she became deaf. Mm -hmm. So I found it a very interesting movie and I, I believe you will too. The final Santa Barbara International Film Festival Artisans Award goes to the editor, Alan Baumgarten, for the Chicago Trial of the Chicago Seven. The whole ensemble actually won the SAG Award last night as Best Ensemble. He's the editor, and uh, he, he, he described editing as the script builds the foundation for a film, mm -hmm. the performance dictates the film, and then somehow or another he has to overlap all of that. Mm -hmm. So as the editor, again I've been talking about editing all night, so as an editor yourself, you, you've made the analogy of running a relay race. 
Yeah, I, I heard it from a friend and I stole it uh, shamelessly. It's uh, that the editor is really the, the last person in a relay race who has to, whether everyone got there late or everyone's running on time, you still have to be the one to take all of that effort and put it over the finish line. And so you have a lot of burdens, but also a lot of, uh, hopefully a lot of talent and good work to ride on as well, and that you just have to up your game to, to meet. Meet the, the finish line. Mm -hmm. Very good. So that's it for tonight. Thank you very much uh, for tuning in again. Uh, thank you for hanging in there for all of this if you did. Uh, coming up this week, it's pretty exciting. We have Amanda Seyfried. I hope that's how we say that correctly. We'll get around to saying it correctly. If it's not, we have Sasha Baron Cohen coming up on Wednesday. We have the directors tomorrow. We have Delray Lindo to go. So uh, we'll see you back at the Rose Wall. Thanks.